Pulse Chain is a copy of Ethereum. It's faster, it's better, it's cheaper. Like, what's up? What's up? Let's go. Hey guys, so what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen when when uh, let's let's just say people do mass migrate over to the Pulse network, and um, you know when there's when there's a lot of people transacting on the network, is it gonna crash? Has it been tested? Did um, the uh, testnet? Uh, really look at these uh, situations when when a lot of people are using it. How how much higher is the gas fees going to go when the network is congested? Is it something we've explored? Does anybody have any any insight on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the PLSC inscription. It's done half a million transactions in like four days, and the gas has not increased once. It stayed the same. I I don't think any other blockchain you could say that for. Even and though it's a that's, description. That just comes down to consensus too, right? Because even if the gas does go up, that just means the price goes up. So it's like, eh, does it actually matter? <laughs> like it's uh when Zen kinda hit the network, that was like Pulse Chain's first technically attack, in my opinion, on the network, just to see like if it could handle it and it, it handled it, but it handled it in a like a you know, gas price net, uh pump. I think uh Per transaction, it was something like 15,000 pulse to do anything, which is still like pretty cheap if you look at it in like just dollar terms. It so depends on the data. It, yeah, I think it took I think it took the attack pretty good. It depends on the call data, right? Like on what your inscriptions, they don't have any data, so it's very cheap to write them and transfer them. And it just makes it a better experience. And instead of like a token with a smart contract where you have to call all these functions and pay high gas... This is just efficient. It's efficiency. So, yeah. And it's nice to see that Richard's not telling his devs to kind of front run any other front end, like coin tools or whatever. On AVAX, they kind of, I don't know if it's for sure, but it seemed like they did something, in my opinion, to target uh, inscriptions because on AVAX, it went up to something like $500 to do anything on the network for a couple hours. So they kind of, I think they targeted like inscription data and they upped the gas. That's what it seemed like to me because it went from two two cents in inscription to like a dollar in inscription, and then uh, yeah, so it's cool that Richard's not there. Like he didn't tell his developers to like target the Zen community back then when we were launching, or to target like inscriptions like hey up the gas on these guys. You know what I mean? Because if he wanted to be like that, he could totally do it. In my opinion, if he did do anything like that, it's kind of it's failing. Like the network is a failure because it's like him centralizing it, kind of like what Doge did. Right, Doge completely turned off most of most of that. How can you be mad at it? It's paying validators, it's writing data, it's getting adoption to your chain. Like it, it's great. I have a total noob question, so don't like kick me in the nuts. Um, so <laughs> when uh, Pulse Chain was you know being developed and all this other stuff, and then I think that they were saying that they were indexing uh, something like that, whatever. I think it was the the scanner. So it was saying you know that the Ethereum chain was being indexed and then that had like a load time and saying oh it's only 30 percent indexed or blah 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 right so the fork actually happened like in may, mid-may or something and that's when like new transactions on pulse chain could occur like that's the beginning of the fork part but is there anything to do with inscriptions as far as like the history of ethereum even though because this is a fork of ethereum so I, I'm curious about like inscriptions. How far back can you go when you inscribe something on Pulse Chain? Yeah, if they wanted to download a full like a full node from Ethereum, it'd probably take like a full year, I think. Because with some of the stuff with Ethereum, you can kind of target like what you want to look at. That's why uh, NFTs on Pulse is the first NFT um, marketplace to actually have like a full node up and running to sync with like what what we had from Ethereum and whatever else. And it took them quite, like, how many months was it after we launched? They didn't get theirs, like, completely downloaded. It depends on how far you want to go back and look at what type of data, right? We could go look at some of the ETH inscriptions if you wanted to go farther back. But I don't think it's worth doing. Like, it, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Because nobody on Ethereum inscriptions, even, like, even with the NFTs, they don't even care about Pulse Chain, in my opinion. They might in the future, but until that's a thing and they want to complain about it, that's when... I would say, all right, well, that's something to look at. We should spin up something for that community or whatever else. But until they're going to complain about it, I would just kind of leave it in the wind because it's, yeah, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, and also uh, 
piggybacking off of that. So I was told by the dev that we could effectively go back to the first block um, when Pulse Chain started and could start indexing from there, um, which I even suggested, you know, I mean, if I'm not the first to put something on there, so be it, you know, if somebody put something on there, they should be rewarded for that. But anyway, he said that that would take like six months. So, I mean, I don't know if he was exaggerating or, or you know, if it would actually take that amount of time, but um, that's how long it would take to search through all of that data and index it. Um, so it's from my understanding that he's going about maybe six weeks um, back in time and um, he's starting from there. So uh, it might be a conversation in the future that we might need to have that, hey, maybe we should go back further and see if anything is there. And oh, and so this is another in, um, thing that the um, inscriptions guys did. There were um, like a handful, I think it's less than 10 inscriptions that they found way back in Ethereum's history. And instead of um, indexing from that point way back from the first one all the way forward um, in their Genesis blocks for inscriptions, they just were able to choose like the eight blocks where the images were, and then somehow just cherry pick those and then start the uh, indexer in proper from way up ahead forward so that they didn't have to go um, through all that data. So that's, um, I guess that's something that we could do um, on Paul's chain if need be at some point in time. Oh, and one more thing concerning that I just remembered concerning the 35 um, megabytes. Um, so that was just a number that I found during all my testing months ago when I was first trying to get something on chain and um, or something inscribed. And uh, then I was told by somebody else that they were actually able to do 38. And so I went to the dev and I was like, hey, man, I only could do 35. And he's like, oh, he's like, that's a that's a MetaMask constraint. Um, so there's a possibility that it's just something, you know, the way the MetaMask is set up that it's at 35 or 38 or whatever it is, and that we can actually do more because he told me, I think it was, he said using Python that um, he was able to do up to one megabyte. So um, I don't know. So that's something else that's going to be um, explored in the future as well, I guess. Let it out. Let it out. Okay. Who? I don't know who had their hand up first, Gary or Agent, but you guys can work it out. Good, Agent. It's Agent. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I, I was glad to see that coin market cap finally came around and um, listed uh, the Pulse Network on, on its rankings list, but the ranking came out at 2,400 2, and I don't know what the hell, when it should really be based on the market cap, uh, I think I saw right now is 7.6 billion, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, that would put it at, at 16 right now, right in front of internet computer. And, um, but they keep denying and they keep the, you know, coin market cap has obviously something against, you know, Richard Hart projects, but it should really be at, at 16, which to me, yeah. it, it kind of makes me bullish you know, that they listed it and put it there despite the fact that the market cap is clear and uh, we know our proper place. If you want to get around that, just go to Yahoo Finance Crypto. They point to coin market cap, but for some reason it lists things properly through Yahoo Finance. Well, oh, cool. I, heard that, that uh, I heard that uh, it's hard coded into the website itself, like at least it was for hacks as far as 201 and all that stuff. Was that the HTML was different versus the actual data, and the actual data is what Yahoo is reading. And that's what I heard. I don't know that's true. They're trying to keep us down, but if um, if history tells us anything, they're not going to keep us down for long. I think it's due to the way Richard Hart designed Hex, and he knows how market capitalization works. And I think that my theory is that Hex market capitalization could overtake Bitcoin's. And I believe that the people at Corn my Coin crap market crap they also know this. Go ahead, Gary. So when it comes to uh, the like, I, I, I the follow up on what Execute and you guys were saying earlier as far as the history of Ethereum, we really don't care except for the cherry picking you said earlier, maybe of inscriptions in the past. So is it like uh, is it like after the fork happened, as far as on Pulse Chain, there's, you know, like, like I can understand the Ethereans that have been supporting and interested in Ethereum since 2014 or even more recently, and they've always been Ethereum based. They don't really care about Pulse Chain necessarily. And then Pulse Chain, you know, 
if it's going to succeed, you know, like a like like a rocket, it's because I think it builds new community and it builds new interesting things. So it kind of goes to what what I think e Executor, someone else in the previous space was saying was, do you care about the ERC twenty PRC twenty copies? Like, I don't think a lot of people care about the PRC twenty copies. Uh, I'm so sorry. Please continue. That was my mistake. I, you know, I haven't seen that they, they care other than like, you know, a raid, like, oh yeah, I can get, you know, Polly can come get 80 ETH because of the, the Pepe stuff or whatever. Right. So like the interesting things are the new things, the new things on the chain. So the inscriptions I think actually is pretty bullish because it's not looking at the history of Ethereum before May 12th. It's, you know, like if you guys are going to like build community around there's value of in an inscription on this chain. It seems like it's the new things. Is, is, you guys have the same feeling, or is that a blind guess? Uh, yeah, I have the same feeling. I think making new stuff over here is more bullish than trying to like do like what Richard's approach is. I don't like from all those OGs I talked to. They like fifty grand is a lot of money to them, so they'd rather just not connect that wallet. And then I tried to get somebody with a CryptoPunk. I was like, well, just take your CryptoPunk, send it to a new wallet, and then take your previous wallet and then connect it to the to our chain and then sell me the NFT. And he's like, yeah, it's still not worth doing. Like, I don't care about it that much. Like, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, there, there's too many aspects when it comes to NFTs that a lot of these guys don't understand. A lot of the, even when it comes to <clears throat> founders giving an NFT away, because it's never been listed and it's never been sold, that has provenance too. So pe like people will pay more if the thing's never been sold out of the first wallet. You know what I mean? So it, there's just different ways of looking at it. And they call it like found, uh, foundation NFT or like founders NFT where like the founder, like Da Vinci ga gifted this lady a uh, picture so it's worth more and she's never sold it type of thing, you know? It's like uh, the Model T that's never been has its original owner type of aspect. Yeah, they call it a survivor, at least in car stuff. Like it's never been painted as the original owner. You know, it's, it's it came straight from the factory to that guy's garage. Yeah, I can understand that. That makes sense. And uh, also real quick, if we're talking about like in terms of inscriptions, if we'd ever bring like any Ethereum inscriptions over to uh, Paul Shane, no, that would never happen. Because first of all, if we went back before Pulse Chain even started to try to bring some of those over, I mean, the large bulk of them would be um, uh, ERC-20 or, you know, the the inscribed ERC-20 uh, tokens and stuff like that. It would just be a bunch of junk. I mean, because from my point of view, all you'd really want to bring over is like some of the art, some of the NFTs. I mean, if anything. But I mean, I think in terms of like inscriptions specifically, like, you know, they're numerical for a reason because it's, you know, it has a starting point for a reason. And the natural starting point would be from the starting point of Pulse Chain, which I still think we should do at some point because um, I, I I just don't think we're going back far enough. But, you know, this it, it, it's just going to take too long to um to do that now. But yeah, in terms of bringing any kind of inscriptions over from ETH, nope, never, never happened. Yeah, I think that I makes sense. Think. It's basically just understanding why do these things have value from that original community? Like the first people that freaked the telephone lines and they got social credibility because they could give free phone calls, you know, through computer networks that weren't theirs. Like that, that, that gave them like social capital with their peers. And it goes to the same sort of thing. Like when you're building any kind of, you know, culture, any kind of group, uh, your, your value system is shared between a few, very, very few people. Like it starts out very, very small, but like the same things that happen over and over. Like if it happened on Bitcoin, it happened on Ethereum. If it happened on Ethereum, it can happen on Pulse Chain. If NFTs are, uh, you know, what made images or music files, you know, valued, what makes inscriptions valued? Like it's not, I don't think it's about like migrating that religion to a new religion. It's not about Ethereans becoming Pulse Chain, like bringing their, their, their money value and their brand capital and their history and say, oh yeah, I used to like Ethereum, but now I like this. I don't, I don't really think that that's the success model. I think the success model is here are the things that were interesting. Subculture grew, uh, you know, what got bartered between peers became more valued, more tradable, more, you know, more, mm, let's say marketing, like, you know, some palindromes or, you know, certain, 
certain Satoshi or certain, um, certain beats or whatever you want to call it. Right. So like there, I, that it's, 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 it's the mechanism that matters more and understanding the mechanism and replicating it, you know, I think is, is what adds value to any of these uh, pulse scriptions. Yep. I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think that it matters that it, it sort of shows the culture of, you know, the, of the new chain of from where it's starting from. And that's why I work so hard to make hex based diamonds, the very first inscriptions that are going to be on pulse chain, because I think that it's a good representation of, of our community of our founder, um, you know, and I think it's a step up from, uh, you know, ether rocks or, or, you know, or Bitcoin rocks and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, anyway, I think, you know, I'm trying to reflect the culture. I'm trying to reflect what's going on here. And I'm trying to give something that will, you know, get the eyes of, of the whole NFT community onto Pulse Chain. And I think this is going to do it. Real, real NFTs. NFTs are just pseudo NFTs. These are real. Hey, Tree City, I saw you had your hand up. Y you still there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I just kind of wanted to chime in about the... It, it is kind of an interesting thought to think about where should the inscriptions begin. It's kind of... Right now, it's kind of an arbitrary point, but it could be moved to the, the launch of Pulse Chain or the beginning of Ethereum. And I, I really wouldn't discount the inscriptions because the, the unique thing about the, the inscription data that's being written, it's still a protocol. So it's not just like random data. So if so, if there were just happened to be some inscription that followed this this data format, I mean, I think that kind of should be counted, right? I mean, if it's just random data or some other protocol that doesn't make sense, then it shouldn't be. But it's kind of an interesting thought. There's definitely room for debate there. I would say it's it's not an issue until it becomes an issue. And until it becomes an issue, I don't think it's worth putting any time into. Like, if somebody did want to come over here and complain about it, we'll hear about it. And then we can, you know, say, okay, let's go back to then. And then you could kind of do what ETH did and just go target those old blocks that these guys want. If they want to recognize that data, we could just spin up or, you know, download data from that era or that block and then and put it into the network and then make those guys happy. But just did, to did do the that descriptions work. launch before Pulse Chain? I'm not East sure. Script? Yeah, it's yeah, it's been around for a while. Pretty it good. was uh, June, live in June seventeenth. It launched. Yeah, live before were the actual chain. Script. That would be interesting if there's forked inscription, ETH scriptions, because it would have the same data type as the pulse scriptions. That is kind of that's kind of interesting. It almost adds a whole level of rarity. Bring it over, <laughs> bring bring it over. But yeah, it really comes back to the centralization of the indexer, or when, where do they begin indexing from? It's kind of the fundamental question. I mean, for, for me, it's block one of Pulse Chain. I, I, you know, I don't see any sort of other argument. Block one of Pulse Chain. That's where our in, our inscriptions start from. And no matter what date it is, block one. Ding, agent, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, numbers. Um, I'm not a dev. I have no technical expertise on how uh, inscriptions work or. Um, Anything having to do with, with uh, programming, coding, um, developing any projects. All, all I know is that price goes up, price goes down. I like to hold. I'm a hodler. And um, personally, I'm here to stay. But what can I tell someone who's developing on Ethereum the benefits? And, and I know the, 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 the quick ones like uh, transaction speed, um, l lower gas fees. You can you can pretty much uh, develop uh, in the same way that you can develop on Ethereum. You can develop on Pulse Chain. But what are other selling points that I can tell devs that are currently working on Ethereum to migrate over to Pulse Chain? How 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 can I convince them? They're gonna have to look at central authorities in the future on Ethereum. I think it's gonna start coming under attack uh, via some governments and other ecosystems. And it comes down to, is that founder going to start censoring the blocks, start censoring the ecosystem, start letting things kind of go ham? Like, that's the only reason why, like, I talk a lot about Richard Hart, but I still, I'm still over here. And I'm only over here because I think he is one founder that's willing to die on the sword for the ecosystem. And I don't think, I think he wants privacy. I think he wants all these good things that crypto should be. And a lot of these 
other chains, I think we're going to see the weakness come out in the in the future with the SEC and whatever else, right? I think a lot of these people, if they did have any major lawsuit, I think they'd fold it almost instantly and give in to whatever government wants them to do whatever, right? And with RH and this ecosystem, I think it's... Uh, I, I think even the community, we stand up and say no. Like, we know what we want, and we have standards over here. We don't really fold just because somebody says this network's good. We're like, okay, the network's good. Let's go check it out. And we go over there, and we're like, oh, this that thing turns off. This is, you know what I mean? There's a lot of smart people over here, and we know what we want. And the other ecosystems, it's smart people too, but a lot of them just seem like paid shills, in my opinion. But if Ethereum can be attacked, wouldn't that make uh, Pulse Chain vulnerable to the same attack? Nope, because Richard Hart structured it differently. Like, to do a 51% attack on Pulse Chain, it would have to be through always wallet. If anybody wanted to buy up most of the supply, one, the price would go to the moon, and two, Richard could always dump on them or not dump on them and just keep front running. Like, if they tried to spin up all these nodes and do whatever to do any type of attack, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work over here because he technically still owns the ecosystem. And I'm not one to FUD, believe me. But I do have a question on uh, some of that money that was being spent off of uh, what someone expressed on the timeline that was uh, money being pulled out of the OA wallet, which supposedly is never touched, but they, you know, he, he showed some transactions there. Um, is that, is that dangerous? Should we be concerned about that? About the OA wallet actually? Uh, do you care what, do you care what I do with my money? No. <laughs> then why does it matter? It's not your money. I think the OA is a feature, not a bug. You gotta, you know, if you think it can be bad, you gotta be open to the possibility that it could be not bad as well. Just, just to be, to be open-minded. I think it's a feature. Once you understand Hex and how it works, it, it, the OA can seem like a bug, but it can also possibly be a feature. That right. Did you, but did I, you I gotta be, and I mention it not because I don't believe in the in the ecosystem. I'm here. I'm involved, but uh, I'm a part of it. But how do I refute these attacks? And uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to gather here. Uh, if, centralized if, ownership isn't bad in in some instances. That's that's kind of what you can say. You know, it's, if, if it's you just had the a reality wallet, of. Uh, a bunch of money in it and it never moved is that bullish or bearish <laughs> you kind of want that money to move right it might look bad but at the end of the day at least it's doing something because uh money that's not moving is not it's not it's not working for you if it's in one wallet well how many wallets have not moved in bitcoin yeah but that, that, that wallet's in bitcoin that wallet's not in usdc or die or whatever something that's volatile that's fine if it doesn't move that it's volatile but something that's pegged to a dollar it's it's not bullish or bearish it's just sitting there kind of doing nothing it's the blank space that should be used up i think yeah i can't give too much alpha away but i think whatever that wallet is doing and has done and will do is bullish for the ecosystem and it's also good because it might look bearish and it's going to shake people out and i'm fine with that because they don't see the bigger picture those people should get shaken out anyways if that scares them they're not ready for for what's about to happen well i bought uh, hex at 24 cents and i held and i'm holding and uh you know it's going to take more than that to shake me out and you know the, the thing is i'm here to learn and uh, these are some of the so some of the questions that are coming out on the timeline and i want to be able to uh, to support the project that i believe in and i'm gathering ammo here Agent, it. also yep. let the developers know that are inquiring they have a copy of all their their ethereum assets over on pulse chain all their tokens all their nfts they're already there waiting for them to play with they just have to add rpc to their metamask and they can see their assets so if they have developed projects on ethereum they can bring their communities over to pulse chain and thrive because they can actually use the bloody thing instead of paying 20 bucks a flip and transaction so there's a bit of incentive there for developers to come over gary please go ahead so uh because i say anything doesn't mean that there's really even speculation at all about the use of the die i think that execute was saying just as far as a dollar amount in a wallet sitting there uh richard in the past has said uh and again for unknown reasons why he would say it and why he said it publicly on uh streams but i remember the inquiry about buying a bank. And I remember a lot of people interested before that around Pulse uh, Hacks or Pulse Chain uh, uh, in getting a charter, you know, kind of a bank charter. And there was speculation, of course, about like, what's that used for? What, why would he do that? You know, that kind of stuff. Like there's all kinds of content around that commentary, the comment that he had made. Um, also, things to think about is um, taking a loan against something that's volatile in the crypto space is is difficult right because you have an example of uh, simon dixon simon dixon uh 
every time that I've engaged with him in Twitter and uh, spaces and things like that, his default about Hex versus Bitcoin is he couldn't take a loan against Hex, but he could take a loan against Bitcoin, right? So he could have a third party contract between lawyers and basically entities. And effectively, uh, I think he's even, he might be the biggest creditor in Celsius. So he took a loan and he said this on Spaces, he took a loan against his Bitcoin in order to play VC as a creditor with Celsius. That's what I recall. I may be wrong. So like you should listen to his content history in Twitter Spaces. He's he's had a year worth of Celsius uh, Twitter Spaces to, to reference. But like he has said that, you know, he, he wants to be able to take a loan, even with counterparty risk, uh, using his Bitcoin. And I know that that exists and in, 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 uh, it also exists in Ethereum. But it's very risky, right? Because Bitcoin goes up a lot and it goes down a lot. So does Ethereum. You know, these blue chip things still drop 85% when the market decides to do it. The waterfall, and cascade and so forth. Uh, I think that personally that DAI pegged can be under contract, legal contract with the entity that's far larger in scale that, you know, you can take a loan against it. Like what would, what would you lend against $600 million? Would you lend $10 million, you know, a 60 to one ratio? What's your loan to value ratio without it having to move wallet, change wallets, without it having to have some smart contract wrapping that everybody would see on chain, like, what is your comfortable ratio for $600 million of die? right? That's the question you have to ask. And then what numbers was saying earlier to someone about like, what's the counterpoint? What can you say? Well, if you can assume that it can be, that the OA could be bad, right? And could dump on everybody, right? That's the assumption for Satoshi for a long time. And then it became normalized that Satoshi's either dead or he can't move it or his grandkids can't figure out the seed words to move the coins. Like this just assumed now by most maxis that Satoshi would never do that, right? Because he he can't, he's dead, or there's just no access. He's locked out. He's like the smart guy that wrote the white paper, but he of course locked himself out because he lost the post-it that had the seed words, right? So it becomes normalized. But like that's also still Bitcoin on that's not die. So you gotta think, at least I have to think, uh, you could be effectively wealthy without ever having to move the die. You can still live the lifestyle you choose to. You still have a lot of leverage, you know, not just in the volatile coins of Pulse Chain or Hex or Forks of Hex or any of that stuff, right? You don't you don't have to play the game of the token up and down. Even the, the Ethereum history, like there's there's all kinds of things that we can see on chain. And the question that can be in your mind is what is the reason for the die to sit on Ethereum? Even I've, I've, I get heat from maximalists in Hex and in Pulse Chain uh, OGs or, or what, if it's not even OGs, just other people, uh, because I say these things and I'll be like, okay, well, I'm not fudding. It's just like you have to have a practical view of what would be the use case. What's not the, uh, the super up? What's not the super down? Just like think about the different possibilities. And I think it's, it's cool that it stayed as, as die and it's on chain and it sits there and it's considered ballast by some to say that, you know, it's, it's, it could be used. It's speculative animal spirits to say, oh, one day that money will be used for something. That's what Somi's content, a lot of it is about. Like, what's the use case? When will it be deployed? Well, that, that feeds a lot of like the market speculation. But you didn't have to ever do anything. The person or the entity that has ever raised and has it sit in the wallet, you don't know their counterparty. You don't know the risk tolerance. You may have a position of maximalism about the character of Richard Hart, but you don't know. Nobody knows. You know, it, it, African priest or Greg the Duck or, uh, you know, large entity with multi-sig, we do not know as far as I understand. At least that's the way I have to feed it in my mind. I think personally, it's sitting in limit orders, waiting to buy Ethereum below <clears throat> five six hundred and Bitcoin below twelve to nine k, give or take. That's just pure speculation on my part. But if I had that much money and I was, you know, the head of state, <laughs> that's what I'd be doing. I'd be sitting there waiting for a crazy crash and then taking it and utilizing it as it goes up. If you know what I mean. 
Yeah, I mean, I think people speculate about that because of some of the commentary he made with Eric Wall on stage at that one event or whatever. And that makes sense. Like, and, and he is you know, allu- uh, alluded to that in so many words. I, you know, so I, I think that that's a good speculation. Um, I don't know how to, and again, I'm not some chain analysis guy by far. So you guys know a lot more about how to do that stuff. But like, if you set a limit order, is it an on-chain recognizable thing? Or is it just set and it would execute through something I'm not aware of? Like, how, how do you know if it could potentially be set as a limit order? Uh, you'd, just see a, you'd have to see a call function from that address to, let's say, one inch. And the call function would just be like, you know, limit order this amount for this for this coin. It'd probably be through, the, uh, through that address. But I, I don't even think... With that bag being as big as it is, I don't even think Richard is waiting to open up any type of call functions from that wallet to one inch or any other DeFi thing until the market starts to go to the downside because it's just too risky to interact with any smart contracts with that amount of money. So I think it's just it's sitting there bare bones, hasn't touched anything, no other contracts <clears throat> other than sending and receiving. Yeah, I think uh, maybe after the SEC thing clears, whenever that is, however long that takes, whatever, maybe maybe more will be revealed.